So again, before I actually introduce uh, Art, I have a big stack of questions, but <laughs> participation from the audience is important. So I'll do a couple to kick it off, and then why don't uh, we then take some questions from, uh, from you all. So, I've, I'm trying to remember the first time I ran into uh, art. That's a long story, which isn't actually fit for, for this camera. But art originally studied at Dalhousie University in, uh, in Nova Scotia, and earned his PhD in uh, 1969 from Caltech. Uh, he spent uh, significant time working up in Chalk River, which is somewhat north of, uh, of Ottawa, until 1992. He was a professor at Princeton University for most of the 1980s until he became affiliated with Queen's University in Ontario, where I believe from there is where you did most of your work at Snow Lab, including uh, the efforts that garnered the Nobel Prize. So, with that, Art, do you want to say a few things before I... Well, it's, it, it, it's a pleasure to be here at Brookhaven, and I'm here for, for two reasons. One is uh, I've been attempting to go to the various laboratories that contributed laboratories and universities that contributed significantly to uh, our success in the SNOW project because I'm very conscious of uh, the fact that I was the director of the, of the project, but there's an enormous number of people who actually uh, won the Nobel Prize when you come down to it, and, and uh, uh, there are people here at Brookhaven who fall exactly in that category. We had tremendous radiochemistry uh, experience here that uh, was applied extremely well, and I'll say more about that this afternoon. Uh, but in addition to that, the topic that we were studying was an outgrowth of the work that uh, Ray Davis did, uh, predominantly when he was here at, uh, at Brookhaven, to look for neutrinos from the sun. And he uh, made measurements that uh, were uh, you know, revolutionary in their nature and garnered him the Nobel Prize in 2002. Um, and uh, uh, the question that that was still remained after his uh, very good work was whether the fact that there were too, too few neutrinos coming from the sun was due to the physics of the sun or due to the physics of neutrinos. And we were able to uh, uh, solve that with the measurements we made. And so Brookhaven has a, a very strong uh, uh, reason. Well, my connections with Brookhaven are a very strong reason for me to be here. and so. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you uh, in this way. This is a little unusual, but uh, anyway, hi. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure what comes next, but anyway, <laughs> let's go for it, David. <laughs> I was going to thank you at the end, but why don't I thank you in advance for answering these rather personal questions? Uh-oh. <laughs> at what point in your life did you realize that you wanted to be a scientist? And then what were the most challenging parts of your education that, that got you there? Well, um, I actually, when I graduated from high school, I, I knew that I really liked mathematics and, and I wanted to try to apply it in some way. And uh, I had, you know, I did reasonably well in, in high school, but not, I wasn't, I didn't win the whole thing, a valedictorian or anything like that. And uh, I think I was too interested in girls at the time. <laughs> My wife, uh, who I met in high school, can attest to that uh, fact. Um, but uh, when I got to university, I, I, had a, I had a wonderful math teacher in high school and a wonderful physics teacher in uh, university. And, and it just, the teachers are really uh, the motivators and, and, and the people that get people going on uh, uh, various topics and, and career choices and so on. And, and I started doing physics and I, I just was able to do it and, and do it very well. And then for, uh, I took a master's degree in experimental physics there and uh, found that I really loved getting in the laboratory and seeing how things work and that carried over to, uh, uh, to work at Caltech, uh, which was, you asked what was tough, that was tough. <laughs> the courses and so on. I actually had, had uh, I took quantum mechanics from, from Feynman when I was at uh, Caltech. And, and interestingly, Ray Davis uh, and John Bacall, who was doing the theoretical work, uh, John Bacall was at Caltech, and Ray Davis came there every summer. And the topic of uh, measuring neutrinos from the sun was very much a topic in, in a laboratory headed by a fellow named Willie Fowler uh, at the time. 
and so I had a sort of a heritage in, uh, in, in this whole area, uh, just even though the majority of my work up to the time I got involved in the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory was in, in basic physics. So uh, maybe that's too long an answer already. <laughs> well, it is a big stack. <laughs> so when you selected your field of study, uh, did you do it for the fame and fortune? Or oh, absolutely. <laughs> The, the, the actual question is, did you consider how it might impact uh, society, or were you primarily satisfying your, your personal curiosities? Well, I, I think I had a, a clear perception that, that both were true. That is, uh, I, I happen to like it, and I seem to be able to do it well. But there's no doubt that, uh, that physics uh, has a, a breadth of impact that uh, uh, you don't really realize when you're doing basic science. I, I, my thesis work for my master's degree there at Dalhousie was on uh, the lifetimes of positrons in metals, positron annihilation. It was 10 years before the, the positron emission tomography process was first developed, uh, which is now a, a, a very standard and very uh, a valuable um, medical diagnostic device. Uh, at the time we were doing basic science, but you always have this uh, feeling that if you understand uh, the basic physics of things, it makes the possibility of applying those principles for the benefit of mankind possible. And uh, I mean, we now understand uh, with great detail how the sun burns. That, that's uh, fusion processes confined by gravity. Uh, there's a big effort on Earth to try to uh, confine fusion magnetically and extract power from it. Uh, we answered a number of questions at the sort of full-scale level uh, with respect to this topic, another example. And the technologies that, uh, that get developed for the rather sophisticated experiments we do on neutrinos and dark matter are things that have application in other, uh, in other circumstances. So you. A little bit of both. Very good. So, can you tell us how you learned that you got the Nobel Prize? And then, now that you've been recognized with it, what's, what's different? Did you get better tickets at Leaf Games? <laughs> <laughs> so, a uh, phone call at 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, <clears throat> your wife answers the phone, and uh, my wife answers the phone. And, Fortunately, I picked up the extension quickly enough because she was about to say, what do you mean by calling at this time of the morning? <laughs> but uh, we both kind of recognized the Swedish accents and, and, uh, and that was kind of amazing. But uh, his mention of the Toronto Maple Leafs that are my, you know, I, I actually grew up in, uh, at a time uh, and listened to them on the radio in Nova Scotia because we didn't have television that had, <laughs> tells, you, tells you how old I am. Uh, and they, won, and they won at that time, it's that long ago <laughs> that that team was actually winning. Um, the last fellow to ask me questions, they, the, the committee members um, each come on and, and, and congratulate you, about five of them. And the last fellow is someone I, I knew uh, and uh, he, he was a great hockey fan as well and we had discussed this in, uh, uh, in uh, the last time I saw him. In, in, in Sweden uh, about a year before, and he reminded me of that. And uh, uh, I asked him later why he did it. He said, well, to some degree to bring you back to Worth. <laughs> but, uh, but also, uh, I asked him you know, whether uh, it was to prove it wasn't a hoax, because there have been examples of this way back, where people get called and, and, and so on. So anyway, uh, out of the full day of interviews, there was one for the for the local paper and they asked me things like this and I mentioned it. So the headline in the local paper was, not a hoax. <laughs> Nothing about the Nobel Prize in the headline, just not a hoax. <laughs> so. so now what's different? Well, what's different is I still, even now, get uh, oh, three or four invitations a week to go somewhere in the world to, to do something. Uh, a, a lot of uh, invitations to serve on uh, review committees and things of that nature, uh, as you might expect. And, uh, and the first couple of years, I think it's true of, of everyone who, who receives the prize, uh, 
uh, you overdo it, and, and I overdid it, and I basically have had to settle it down now so that I have a bit of time at home uh, before uh, I go to the next thing I'm doing, and also uh, direct uh, some of the things I'm doing to uh, things that I can see will be valuable from a research point of view, which is really the one of the main reasons why I'm here. We, we just had some very productive discussions this morning about a future project on dark matter, where the Brookhaven expertise is, is something that could be very valuable. Um, and uh, I saw one of the questions earlier, I don't get a better table in a restaurant, because <laughs> generally uh, I'm not recognized, and, and even on campus back in, in uh, Kingston, Ontario, uh, uh, I've been, they have not put my picture up along, they've, they've put up lots of things that say a Nobel Prize was won here uh, recently, but uh, not my picture, so I don't get, uh, uh, I don't get recognized, which is, that's just fine, because <laughs> every one of those is an extra five minutes uh, <laughs> that you get uh, a little bit disruptive. I did have one interesting example of that where a student came up to me and said, uh, you're Professor McDonald, right? I said, yes. He said, thank you. And I said, okay, but uh, oh, I have to explain. He said, uh, uh, my high school uh, best friend went to University of Western Ontario and I went to Queens and we've been arguing for the, I'm a freshman, we've been arguing for the whole year uh, about uh, uh, which is a better university. Now all I have to do is say to him, are there any Nobel Prizes at your university? <laughs> <laughs> and I win. <laughs> so it's, it's that sort of, uh, well, by and large, uh, positive notoriety. I have had an opportunity, for example, to serve on a committee that reviewed the way in which uh, funding is done by the federal government, all the way from humanities right through uh, the natural sciences and the committee represented that sort of diversity. We had a very good response from the community and we've had a very good response from the government in terms of the support for, for basic research. Our, our government is one that uh, campaigned on evidence-based decision making and they've taken many of the recommendations of our committee and have been increasing funding for basic science and basic humanities as well. And uh, so you, you have the feeling that those sorts of opportunities are definitely things you should take. And it worked out well in this circumstance. Thank you, All right, All right one more, and then we'll, uh, we'll go to the audience. In, uh, in what way did uh, Brookhaven contribute to the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory project for which you were recognized with the Nobel Prize? Yeah, well, uh, very substantially. Uh, we, uh, protect, we, the principal collaborator back in the days of Snow, uh, was uh, Dick Hahn, who I'm, I'm hoping to see uh, this afternoon, actually, and this evening. But uh, uh, now, uh, uh, Min Feng Ye uh, is uh, contributing significantly. Um, he actually, Min Feng actually spent a year on site in, in Sudbury during the snow project. These are radio chemists. That's a very uh, unique capability. Uh, I mean, it's a Ray Davis capability. And it's uh, low radioactivity is the main objective here. We detected neutrinos uh, by going two kilometers underground, creating an ultra clean laboratory, making sure that everything we did was very low in radioactivity because we only observed one neutrino an hour uh, from the sun. And in order to do that, we had to restrict the background to be 10 times lower than that. So we ended up with radioactivity in the water, which corresponded to one radioactive decay per day per ton of water from the uranium and thorium contamination. Everything, this table, everything has a part in a million uranium and thorium in it. And so uh, that was, uh, uh, for example, a billion times purer than ordinary tap water. And the, uh, the Brookhaven scientist contributed not only to achieving that, but also to uh, uh, making measurements that proved that you had achieved that with good accuracy. And that was essential for the success of the experiment. And so uh, the same thing is happening now in a, uh, a present experiment called SNOW Plus, 
in which we've replaced the central element with uh, the opportunity to look for a very rare radioactivity called neutrinoless double beta decay, uh, which will, uh, uh, we hope, enable us to know some basic properties of the neutrino uh, that may help us to understand uh, how neutrinos participated in the processes that resulted in a matter-dominated universe. Because we, we start in the Big Bang with energy being converted into equal amounts of matter and antimatter. Positrons being an example, that's the corresponding antimatter particle to electrons. Somehow, all of that antimatter, equivalent to everything you see around you, has decayed away. And it is thought that neutrinos contribute to that process. And by studying this rare radioactivity, we can address that question. So uh, uh, Brookhaven has been a, a, a very significant part of and continues in SNOW Plus uh, as, we, uh, as we went forward. So questions from the audience? Let us, let us go to the audience. There is a microphone for. So you're collaborating with Brookhaven, but this must be global. I mean, there's a team in Australia. How, I'm assuming that this is all going on around the world. How do you keep forward motion when it's this dispersed? I mean, is, I, mean I, I know you have great communication access now relative to 20 years ago, but, but there must be a phenomenal amount of work just in terms of building these relationships and the science. Uh, yes, there is. Um, I think uh, the wonderful thing about, uh, <clears throat> about scientists is that uh, there has been open communication, actually. There always has been. I mean, uh, I was working on experiments back in the 1970s in the midst of the Cold War where similar experiments were happening in Russia. Completely open information about such things. Scientists know how to, how to uh, communicate with each other, and they document their work, and so you can read what someone else has done, you can then contact them, uh, ask them details about how they've done it, uh, ask them if they'd like to collaborate because you can see that their expertise would be valuable. So, uh, for example, the, the experiment that I'm uh, here as a part of uh, discussing with people at, at Brookhaven has 350 scientists from uh, 63 institutions around the world, 13 countries, uh, and it's in the field of dark matter detection. Uh, Brookhaven is involved in the Dune, the Dune project, and there are actually some synergies between what they're doing and what we're doing. We're both using liquid argon. Uh, Dune is a, is a broad international project that uh, happens in the United States for studying properties of neutrinos, also related to that question about the early universe I mentioned earlier on. And so uh, I think scientists have always been very good at uh, communicating uh, at the level where it matters, on, on the details of things, because they document their work, it's open, and uh, you know who to talk to. Yes, and, and there's an additional problem that goes along with that that connects with the diversity problem that was mentioned earlier, and that is, in, in my field of physics, there are still uh, relatively few women in the field, and so uh, that's actually a topic I've been concentrating on, and I've, I've donated to uh, projects to try to improve the, uh, uh, the number of women uh, in the discipline. Um, uh, one of the things that this committee I was mentioning earlier was concerned about was, uh, uh, first of all, attracting people to uh, academic life, because it, it extended from humanities to, to the sciences, but in particular to the sciences, but also uh, uh, the systems have a tendency to uh, uh, 
uh, to penalize early career researchers if you aren't very careful. It's the older guys like me that, uh, older white guys like me that uh, uh, have obtained a reputation and ask for a, a research grant that are successful. And so one of the things the committee suggested was that it's very important to try to level the playing field. And, and uh, maybe in order to do that, you have to emphasize a little more the opportunities for early career people. Um, so I think it, it's not just a problem of bringing people into the field. It's a question of appropriate career progression once you get there. Uh, some fields, uh, in terms of diversity, have, uh, have been very successful. I think there are, more, uh, there are more women in medicine, for example, studying at Queen's University, where I'm from, uh, than there are men. But in physics, it's still very small. And so efforts, particularly efforts to, to talk to people at grade six and seven level, uh, is what's important, and that's that's part of uh, some of the things I've been uh, trying to support. So. I'm happy to jump back into these, and then we'll take another break in a bit. All these questions seem to be multiple part questions. My favorite part of this one is the last part. So, is the Nobel Prize a capstone or a starting point for meaningful work? What happens to the work you've done after you receive such an accolade? And then my favorite part, what are you working on now? <laughs> I've already said a bit about that, uh, the third part. Um, <clears throat> I think, actually, I've been asked a number of times about uh, sort of the reaction within our scientific collaboration to the Nobel Prize having been awarded. I think it really is true that, that back in 2001, too, when we got the results that we set out to accomplish, it could have been one answer or the other with respect to whether it was the sun or whether it was neutrinos that were a problem, if we could do it. When we had that bit of science and published that, <clears throat> that was really the, the main thing that, that the scientists uh, uh, on the project were, uh, uh, were pleased about. Receiving a Nobel Prize after you've done a lot of work is uh, getting a recognition from a very highly respected group of people who look very carefully at, uh, uh, well, proposals from all over the world for the awarding of the, of the prize. And so it, it's, a, it's a very nice recognition. But scientists don't set about to win a Nobel Prize. They set about to do good science. And I think that really was true of, of, of our collaborators. And uh, I mean, it took us a long while to actually get the results. And, uh, but people, uh, persevered, and uh, we had 273 authors altogether on our papers, but 200 of them were either students or postdocs in the process of, of, uh, uh, of the experiment. And so it was a real educational exercise as well as a scientific exercise. And those people are, are all over the place. I, I, you know, we were doing very basic science. But 10 years after we finished taking data, I decided it was a great time to figure out where these people are. And 25% uh, of them are, are university professors. 30% uh, of them are women, actually. So we, we made a bit of progress. In, in physics, that's pretty darn good. Um, about 25% of them work in government. 25% uh, uh, of them um, own their own, well, CEOs of their own companies or chief technology officer for other companies. Uh, and there's about 25% yet left. 7% uh, of those uh, out of that 25 are in the financial industry, uh, people who work for JP Morgan and uh, things like that. And I've lost, lost track of the rest uh, of, uh, I guess, uh, national laboratories like this are another uh, major destination for people. But it's not just <laughs> academics that we're producing by doing these basic science research uh, activities. Uh, people who are educated on that learn how to use evidence to make decisions. And they use that in a wide variety of different occupations after they're finished uh, with their thesis in, uh, in basic science. Um, my answer to only part, I think, but what did I miss? <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. 
It's important to make good choices. Can you tell us some of the, or perhaps one of the best choices you've made in your career? And then perhaps more interestingly, is there a choice you wish you'd made differently? Um, okay, the best choice I made, I already mentioned, and I met her in high school. <laughs> good answer. And, and no, I wouldn't change that for a moment. We have four children and nine grandchildren, eight of whom are girls, and that's part of my interest in, in uh, some of them may possibly be uh, uh, inclined in math and science. Um, uh, other choices, uh, the Snow Project obviously was a, was a good choice, but I didn't know it at the time. I actually, they were looking for a director of the project who had some experience and was Canadian, and uh, I had been at Princeton through the 1980s and uh, was already involved in the project. And so uh, I actually decided to leave a tenured position at Princeton to go back to Canada before we had the project uh, approved. And so uh, that, was, uh, that was a big leap. Um, but it turns out that you can do good science in many different places. And I knew I wasn't, you know, there was, I wasn't getting rid of my safety net by making this decision. Um, but that was a tough one, which turned out okay. But I certainly didn't know at the time it was going to be the case. All right, the next bunch are fast, so don't think too long about these answers. What would don't you... talk too long after you ask the question. I didn't say that. <laughs> What would you be if you weren't a scientist? Oh boy, I'd be uh, the captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs, but I don't have the capability. Of <laughs> well, that, doing that, that was efficient. Uh, that answers the second question. <laughs> Do you have a favorite sports team? <laughs> What's yes. your favorite type of music? Classical music, actually. I, I uh, enjoy uh, uh, classical concerts and uh, and and uh, listening to it. Uh, uh, on the radio and so on, uh, so uh, that's my choice. Do you have a favorite board game? Still Monopoly, actually. <laughs> Great with grandchildren. Pencil, paper, or computer for your best work? I tend to, to uh, use uh, computers uh, predominantly, although uh, scribbling notes, and especially when you're trying to work something out as you're thinking about them, writing on a piece of paper is useful too. Where do you have your best ideas? Sometimes I wake up at four o'clock in the morning and something that's really been bugging me, hey, there's the answer uh, that you think of. Uh, but most of the best ideas, I think, and it's true of almost anybody, are you have something that you think might work and you sit down and you work your way through the, the relevant parts of it that, are, that you have to know. You look up the past references, you look up the, the details of how does this material behave or the other material, and uh, I'll go so I think you, your you best quotes ideas come from that diligent work of trying to understand if it really will work once you approach it. Any burning questions from? Not burning, really. You still have to take out the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> no I question about that. I thought I'd ask. Uh, you talked about being pulled into a lot of committees and getting all these requests on a weekly basis. Um, but being the stature that you have as a Nobel Prize winner uh, gives you other opportunities. So, where have you chosen to go uh, actively seek out opportunities? Well, uh, I'm, I'm spending a fair amount of time right now on this particular project using, uh, using liquid argon to study dark matter. Uh, I'm also uh, somewhat involved in the Snow Plus project that uh, Min Feng is actively involved in. So uh, uh, from, a, from a physics point of view, that's the sort of thing that I'm, that I'm doing. Um, I, I, don't say yes to many of those committees unless there's uh, this committee to change the uh, funding structure in Canada uh, is one that I saw there was a potential to actually have an impact. And there are a couple of other things like that that they're working on that uh, uh, I'm still somewhat involved in that relate to it. Um, 
so I'm, I'm just trying to look at things that, that have an impact. Uh, certainly the, the STEM topic and the diversity topics are things that I have more of a tendency to say yes to than otherwise. Um, maybe that's a fairly complete answer. There was a question over here. Um, I think it was asked earlier, but I don't think you answered it. Well, you know, on the way to Nobel Prize, you made a lot of right decisions, but you must have learned some from some mistakes. Could you tell us some big ones? <laughs> <laughs> big mistakes. Uh, um, oh well, um, we certainly had some problems with the design of the uh, experiment, uh, very largely because we were uh, we were trying to do things that hadn't been done before. And so uh, we had, uh, that's where I say uh, I had extremely good collaborators because we came together as a team to try to address the different options that could be causing the problems we had and uh, uh, fortunately were able to, on the fly so to speak, solve the problems and get on with the, uh, with the project. And so I guess you would call those uh, uh, mistakes. Um, I, I don't have anything that's a glaring mistake in, in, in personal life and other things that I would, uh, I would speak to. I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with my personal life these days. <laughs> All right, I've got one more question which I'd like to close with. It's my favorite one at the bottom of the stack. Before we close, Art, I want to really thank you for coming. Um, you and I have had the opportunity to have dinner in three different countries now. Uh, you've come here to you know, acknowledge Brookhaven's contributions uh, to your previous efforts, including uh, the work on the Nobel Prize. So thank you for that. And what excites me most is you've come here seeking collaboration on, on future effort, efforts, which I'm you know, you know, personally uh, you know, very excited about. So, all right. So with that, let me ask you this question. <laughs> As Newton remarked, presumably Isaac Newton, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And so the question is, whose shoulders have your footprints on them, and who have you invited to stand on your shoulders? <laughs> well, the, the first one, uh, uh, whose shoulders have we stood on, and uh, Ray Davis is clearly uh, uh, a prime example of that. Um, Willie Fowler is another, another individual. Uh, he, he was a, a very unique personality. He just exuded fun with uh, the process of doing physics. In fact, I was, when I had to write, the, write up the lecture I gave at the time of the Nobel Prize, and by the way, that week in Stockholm is just it's an incredible experience in, in, uh, in your life, the, the, way they, uh, uh, the way they program you through that week. For, different things, including a, a student event that starts at midnight after everything else has happened that the day you receive the prize. And I still remember tasting Swedish scotch for the first time at three o'clock in the morning. And it, it, it's fantastic. But uh, uh, the uh, uh, approach that Willie Fowler had to doing science was let's have fun with this. The seminars at Caltech when I was there we're at 7.30 on a Friday night, followed by a party at one of the professor's houses. And, uh, and the professors, some of them played the piano, there was a band made up of the graduate students. It just was a, you were having fun, and you didn't shy away from asking very good uh, uh, philosophical or, or scientific questions in the process. So those are two I would mention. We all stand on the shoulders of people like Isaac Newton. Uh, whose shoulders are stand, uh, who are standing on my shoulders? Well, I, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, blessed by uh, the group of people that are working, for example, on Snow Plus. I mean, that's the ultimate recycling. <laughs> it's a $70 million experiment that's now about to do uh, one of the most sensitive uh, neutrinoless double beta decay experiments in the world using the original apparatus. We bought 10,000 phototubes from Hamamatsu in 1991-92, and all but 10 of them are still working, essentially the way that they uh, worked in the first place. Um, 
and uh, the leadership of that experiment uh, is, 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 is very good uh, and, and, and they're doing good things. And then uh, in, in dark matter, the study with liquid argon, um, the team that has been working on a, a detector using that at Snow Lab, it's been a pleasure to work with this younger generation and, uh, uh, and, and I see great potential for the next while, maybe even for my granddaughters to work on. So uh, that's uh, the sort of thing that uh, gives you a good, a good feeling as well. But the younger generation is uh, inspirational to us old folks. So I think that's my answer. Why don't we close with that and thank Art.